Let me uh, just begin the questioning, uh, and then I will yield to my colleagues uh, for their questions. Uh, I'll throw out a few questions, and if you wouldn't mind jotting them down, because I do have about 100. <laughs> I exaggerate a little bit. Um, there's been a lot of criticism about who's in charge. Uh, is it the health ministers in country? Uh, WHO uh, puts out a lot of press releases. Dr. Brantley made a, uh, an observation, of, and I think it's a very good one, that agencies like the WHO remain bound up by bureaucracy. Their speeches, proposals, and plans, though noble, have not resulted in any significant action to stop the spread of Ebola. The U.S. government must take the lead immediately to save precious African lives and protect our national security. Um, you know, I know that you might be loath to criticize WHO, but we need to know who actually is in charge on the ground. Um, secondly, if I could, um, the military 3,000 deployment. Obviously, that was weeks, certainly days in preparation. Interagency coordination had to have been a part of that uh, for that announcement to be made. I'm just wondering if you could tell us who will be deployed. Um, I'll never forget um, making a trip to the uh, border of Iraq and, and um, Turkey immediately after the Kurds flocked to that border, and many were dying from exposure, disease, and Operation Provide Comfort was established within about five days. A group of us went over there to take a look at it and to talk to people. And if it wasn't for the special forces and the work they did, and they handed the baton eventually to uh, NGOs and others who took that baton and helped uh, those individual Kurds. Uh, but for about a month, had it not been for the special forces, uh, particularly the military docs and others that were there, uh, hundreds if not thousands would have died. So my, my question is, how will that force be configured? Will it be primarily MDs, not primarily, but made up of a significant uh, portion of MDs and, and nurses and others? I know that we've heard that they will be constructing, or I believe that's going, what the one thing they're going to do in Liberia, um, you know, hospital beds or at least places where people can find uh, uh, refuge uh, and get help. Uh, but what will that configuration look like? Uh, Dr. Brantley, again, in his testimony, makes an excellent point. He goes, for too long, private aid groups have been confronting the Ebola ep epidemic without adequate international support. Then he says, these organizations cannot go it alone. A significant surge in medical boots on the ground uh, must happen immediately to support those already working in West Africa. And he goes on in his testimony, how many medical personnel are needed? How many have been deployed? And will this 3,000 deployment of our service members be significantly uh, made up of medical personnel? Uh, force protection, if, uh, and Dr. Fauci, you might want to speak to this as well. Obviously, when you're dealing with, a, with a, an epidemic uh, and people can contract this disease, gives new meaning to force protection, you know, all the usual. Uh, how many protective suits will be needed? Uh, do you have adequate access to those suits uh, and gear? Uh, you know, as Dr. Brantley points out, he took every precaution, and he still got Ebola. So the question would arise, and I'm sure for the individual service members being deployed and their families, will there be adequate protections? Is there more money needed? Uh, you know, as, um, as my friend and colleague uh, pointed out at the Rules Committee the other day, uh, uh, you know, 88 million has, is in the supplemental. Is that enough? Uh, you know, we should leave no stone unturned to make sure that people are protected and, and hopefully saved from this hideous disease, but putting many more Americans into harm's way, no stone should be left unturned to making sure they're protected as well. Uh, are there any gaps there? And if you could speak to that. Let me also ask you, how do you attract medical personnel to, to be deployed? Uh, you know, they're ordered by way of military, that's one thing, uh, but how do you incentivize it so that, you know, many of the, the faith-based groups go there and risk their lives, as do the non-faith-based, out of pure love of the African people or wherever it is that they're deployed. But now we're dealing with a pandemic. Um, how do you incentivize and are people coming forward uh, to go? The range of, of the estimates of infections. Um, uh, and Dr. Fauci, you might want to speak to, is there a possibility or probability that this could mutate into an airborne uh, 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 you know, infection? Uh, right now we're told that's not the case. Uh, but is that a possibility? And uh, again, if you could put any kind of number on how many medical personnel are needed 
to be deployed. You know, it, it, I, I, I've been trying, I read everything I can on Ebola, talk to people nonstop about it. I still don't know how many people, because so much of the infrastructure, as we all know, in, in West Africa for healthcare has been decimated, as well as the NGOs that were there early on, uh, where their personnel have been uh, hurt as well. And finally, uh, to Dr. Borio, if you could, at our last hearing, I raised the issue of TKM Ebola and the FDA's uh, suspension of the trials. Uh, has that changed uh, since, um, you know, uh, I remember reading the company's information on that, and they were kind of surprised, uh, but has that been reversed uh, on, that, on that particular uh, uh, drug? Ms. Lindborg? Uh, yes. You, okay, uh, Dr. Fauci, Fauci, if you could. No, no, actually, uh, Nancy was going to, I think, take the first question. Yeah. Was going to take the first question. I, I, there are several you asked me for, which I'll be happy to answer, but I think Nancy's going to take the first question. So um, it, it, it might, let me also offer Chairman Smith that it might be helpful to come and do a more, even more detailed walkthrough, since that seems to be something that is of, of great interest. What I will say um, is that the, uh, there's a two-star General Williams from uh, AFRICOM, who arrived in Monrovia yesterday and is already beginning to, to work closely with the DART on detailing out the exact configuration of the mission. Uh, Africa, it will come out of the African Command. Uh, there will be a large contingent of logisticians and engineers, medical planners, planners, uh, that it will be setting up the fundamental nerve center that will be able to support this overall response. Uh, there will also be 60 medical trainers who will be operating the training facility. And uh, one of the critical barriers in moving forward a more robust response has been uh, uh, several key constraints. First is uh, there has not been confidence that people could get in and out of the region. Therefore, we're looking at laying down the significant lift capacity um, that will serve the entire region. Secondly, people are worried because they're, they've been uncertain about medevac in the event that they are ill. And so we are working to increase uh, the reliability and availability of medevac services for health workers. Thirdly, they've been concerned about lack of health care for the health workers, which is why the military is bringing in a 25 bed hospital for health care workers. It will be staffed. Uh, by public health workers, uh, teams of 65 at a time out of HHS. Um, and the first of the 13 plane loads bringing that hospital in arrive on Friday in Monrovia. So that will be set up. Um, and then finally is the lack of training. It is not so much that you need high level medical uh, uh, expertise so much as there needs to be rigorous, very disciplined infection control um, most urgently is a large cadre of basic care workers. Um, and that is part of what this training will seek to do is create a pipeline of, of work of, of health care workers who understand how to minimize the infection and how to run a clinic that is absolutely rigorous in following the right kind of procedures. Um, and we will be working with MSF to adopt their training so that that's available to a larger cadre. Um, finally, there are doctors needed both for the, e for the Ebola treatment units, but also for the larger revitalization of the health systems. Um, as uh, Dr. Bell mentioned, this is a problem throughout the country, and it's training those health care uh, providers and those clinics also on rigorous infection control because of the stories that we've heard of people coming in and, and being treated for other problems and end up, uh, you have transmission of the Ebola virus. So there, there's that, that whole package of issues that when we address those, the goal is to unlock a greater capacity of organizations and healthcare workers who can come in augmented by this um, extraordinary capability that the U.S. military is bringing. And we do have sufficient monies allocated? Uh, I mean, is there... The D DOD uh, has uh, requested a $500 million um, uh, uh, re Reprogram. uh, reprogramming, and previously, and I believe today, they'll be submitting an additional $500 million. Now, is that estimate 
or that request being based on what they think can be gotten, or is it to really get the job done? You know, we know that, that, that UN agencies notoriously underestimate what the cost will be, uh, because they think when they put out their, their request to, to other nations, donor nations, they think that's all they're going to get, rather than what is the need, and then we fight like the devil to get that money uh, allocated. Um, I've had that argument with them for 30 years uh, in Geneva. Ask for what is really needed, even if we don't reach it, so we know what the true, uh, uh, what you're asking for is what is needed? Well, that's for the military's budget. Yes, I mean, but also, like the 88 million. The 88 uh, million, uh, and USAID has allocated yes. 100 million from our budgets. We, th we think so for at least the initial response, okay. but this is, un this is unprecedented. This is new territory for all of us. And so as we lay down this urgent scaled response, we will be closely monitoring to see wh what impact it makes and what else we might need. Gotcha. Dr. Fauci, thank you. So um, let me answer the question about this, the potential scope, which is important because there's a lot of confusion about that. So the issue is, the question that's asked and that sometimes frightens people, is that is it possible that this virus would mutate and then, by the mutation, completely change its modality of transmission, namely going from a, vac a, a virus that you get by direct contact with bodily fluids to a virus that's aerosolized. So if I'm talking like this, I can give it to Nancy or to Lou. So let me explain to you how that possibly could happen and why I think it's unlikely, not impossible. Ebola is an RNA virus, and when it replicates, it replicates in a sloppy way. It makes a lot of mistakes when it starts trying to duplicate itself. Those mistakes are referred to as mutations. Most mutations in this particular situation are irrelevant, and namely, they don't, they are not associated with a biological function that changes anything. They just mutate and it's meaningless, mutate and it's meaningless. Every once in a while, rarely, a mutation, which is called a non-synonymous mutation, that's what scientists call it, does have a change in biological function. That change, if it occurs, if you historically look at viruses that mutate, it generally, if it changes a function, modifies an already existing function. It makes it either a bit more virulent or a bit less virulent. It makes it a little bit more efficient in spreading the way it usually spreads or a little less efficient. What it very, very rarely does is completely change the way it's transmitted. So although this is something that is possible, and I need to emphasize, because whenever I try to explain it, people might think I'm poo-pooing it, I'm not. It's something we look at very carefully, and we actually have grants and contracts with organizations like the Broad Institute in Boston, which very carefully follow the sequential evolution of the virus to alert us if, in fact, this is happening. So A, we take it very seriously. B, it's something that we look at and that we follow closely. But we don't think it's likely to happen. So I would rather that I lose sleep and, and Lou and Nancy and Beth lose sleep over that, but not the American public lose sleep over that because we are watching it very carefully. Having said that, what is likely, and this gets to everything we're talking about, is that if this virus keeps replicating and keeps infecting more and more people, you are going to give it more of a chance to mutate. So the best possible way that we can take that off the table is to actually shut down this epidemic. And if we do, as I always say, a virus that doesn't replicate doesn't mutate. So if you shut it down, then that thing is off the table. I hope that was clear. And your best case estimate on September 17th, what this could evolve into? I mean, exponential was used yeah. several times uh, during your, your uh, well, statement. Well, Mr. Chairman, the estimate is going to be directly related to our response because it's, it's kind of a, a race. If our response is like this and this is going like that, as I said, this is going to win all the time. And that's the reason why we were excited and, and, and pleased to hear that the president came out and said what he did and we're going to see the things that Nancy and others have been talking about because once you get over that curve, then you start to see the coming down. Now, 
That could be within a period of a few months if we really put a full court press on. If we fall behind, it could go on and on. So it's almost impossible to predict without relating it to the degree of your response. Could I ask you, again, uh, Dr. Brantley talk, calls for a surge of medical boots on the ground. How many doctors, medical personnel, U.S., are now in the impacted areas? And how many do you think will be there in the next month, How many uh, next several months? I've been trying to get a handle on that for some time. So uh, one of the things we're doing is, is uh, supporting a worldwide call uh, for this, this is really going to be an all hands on deck response. Uh, the African Union has uh, mobilized 100 uh, health, what they call health keepers, which is uh, doctors, nurses, and other health clinicians. And the U.S. is supporting their mobilization. Their advanced team is on the ground right now, led by um, a Ugandan doctor who led the Ebola response in Uganda. Um, the Chinese have mobilized medical personnel. And um, the UK and EU are both contributing facilities, labs, and funding. So we'll continue to, to, to mobilize. One of, the, um, one of the questions is how many of these Ebola treatment units we will need. Each Ebola treatment unit, according to the MSF model, takes about 216 people, the majority of whom are basic health care providers, basic care providers, um, uh, augmented by... Uh, you know, a chief medical officer, a lot of infection control, logistics, uh, water sanitation, um, those kinds of uh, management capabilities. So what we're uh, seeking to do is to create a pipeline of the trained medical care providers with this 500 a week training facility augmented by additional support training and direct provision of that management infection control piece. Um, because ultimately, the most important thing is, is rigorous, discipline, almost command and control of the inf oh, and of inf If I could just to get back to that, how many medical boots on the ground do we have as of today? Uh, U.S., U.S. You, do you, we, have, we are focused right now not on the direct care, but rather on providing the system that can uh, enable a full-throated response. We have um, supported organizations like International Medical Care, uh, and, and we're in discussions with several other organizations that will bring, uh, International Medical Care has a 60-bed unit that they've stu stood up, and it's a combination of medical and other personnel that are needed to make each one of these uh, Ebola treatment units functioning. And but we do have doctors and nurses correct. on the ground. Could you get back to us if you can find that number? <clears throat> Because, you know, the, I understand the training component, and that's extraordinarily important. But we know that there must be, including in the military deployment, a number of doctors and nurses that, that will be a part of that, uh, just to know what our commitment is on that side of it. Yes, and, it, and it's part of a much larger number. It, we'll, get you, we'll get you the breakout That'd of what the 25-person uh, the DART, the 150, 115 people already in the region, uh, and the 3,000 who are being mobilized. And uh, anyone else? Uh, yes, Dr. Bell. Uh, I, I was, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Sh Smith. And I actually just wanted to mention that I led the field team in New Jersey during the uh, 2001 anthrax attack, so I, I know your district actually quite well from the old days. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of other things about this uh, training pipeline to build on what uh, Nancy was saying and to make a couple of these important points that the majority of the workers um, are local workers, but they, there is a need for some um, nurses and doctors and, and more higher trained uh, healthcare workers. And it, uh, we have at CDC, um, working with MSF, established um, a training program which will be held at, in Anniston, Alabama, um, every week. It's a three-day uh, program which is meant to have a pipe, build a pipeline of U.S. healthcare workers that are getting ready to deploy to the region. Our first um, a training which will begin next week and is already um, full at something like uh, 40 uh, healthcare providers. So, 
as Nancy says, we need sort of a um, very multifaceted and multidisciplinary approach to addressing the problem. And um, at our end here um, at, uh, at CDC, we, we've had the, we will have these series of um, classes every week um, for the foreseeable future to help um, build that uh, pipeline. Just let me ask uh, two final questions. Um, the 3,000 deployment, uh, when will the full component uh, contingent be, be actually in theater? Um, and again, to reassure not only those who will be deployed, but their families, uh, will they have the protective gear in adequate numbers from masks and the like uh, to ensure that they do not contract a disease? And Dr. Borio, if you could speak to the issue of the uh, TKM Ebola um, and whether or not that is now, uh, the suspension has been lifted so that uh, trial could go continue. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm unable to discuss a specific uh, product today, but what I can tell you is that uh, clinical hold issues, um, it's based on our assessment of the benefit risk profile for a proposed clinical study. So, whereas a product may be on clinical hold for a specific study, it may not be on hold for different types of studies. For example, sometimes the dose or frequency proposed in a, in a, in a study um, does not allow us to we leave that the benefits all the risks. In addition, um, sometimes we put a study on hold because of adverse events that are identified immediately after you know, uh, using the, the drug in the first few volunteers. Another reason for a study to be on hold has to do with the patient population that is being studied on that particular proposed study. So there are many reasons for a study to be on hold. Uh, it's rare that uh, we are not well, in situations where a study is on hold, you'll work with the company very closely, especially in a situation like this with Ebola, to be able to make sure that we can design the studies that where the benefit-risk balance would be more appropriate. Again, is there cross-conversations? You mentioned how flexible FDA is, like with NIH and others, to ensure that... I mean, I was shocked when that hold was placed because I read a lot about the drug doesn't make me an expert even this much, but there were some encouraging signs. And when you only have three or so uh, drugs in the pipeline, uh, that's not a large universe. Yeah. We are working very closely uh, with our colleagues at the NIH, at BARDA, and DOD, as well as all the different companies that, are, that have products of interest to the U.S. government to move, doing all we can to move their development prog programs forward as fast as we can. Okay, let me, again, uh, Ms. Limborg, do we know when the 3,000 will actually be there? Yeah, I know it'll be going in components, but uh, when fully will they be deployed? In, they're going in components, and I will just quote General Dempsey, who said they will move as fast as they possibly can until they hit the laws of gravity. Okay. So they are fully, fully seized and deployed. And fully protected. Yes, and um, if, I, I just want to um, underscore one, one other point um, in response to your questions, and that is we are continuing to uh, conduct outreach efforts so that we can uh, uh, find other medical workers, doctors, nurses, and physicians' assistants who are interested in working with organizations who are responding, and that's the website, usa.gov slash Ebola. And with the training that's available and the pipelines of this critical gear that the response will provide of PPE, et cetera. Thank you. Ms. Bass? Oh. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I just to your point about um, uh, are, will the force be adequately pr protected, I just wanted to say that, you know, um, at CDC we have over 100 um, young um, trainees, many of them in the field, and um, so we've worked very hard um, on the sort of information people need ahead of time, very, very clear delineation of the sorts of protective equipment, things to do to protect yourself, um, and what to do when you're in a situation that you think is perhaps not as safe and secure as it should be. And so this is the sort of information that I think um, we've spent actually quite a while now. We've had people in the field um, uh, sort of perfecting, and it's the sort of thing I think that um, can be used with the military. Um, we all want to make sure that people are as safe as, as, as uh, humanly possible. The other thing I f 
see off of my list of questions, I just wanted to address your question about the funding and to just say from the CDC perspective that the $30 million is enough to get us through the continuing resolution and allow us to keep our people in the field, but that we are going to be considering um, during the period of the CR uh, what additional funding we might need for the rest of the year. Thank you, Dr. Bell. You know, in a conversation I had with the President of Guinea, who has deployed his military, um, I was concerned about how well protected they were, um, you know, when they rush in to be of assistance and then all of a sudden they find themselves uh, contracting the disease. So, and I'm very concerned about our military as well. I'd like to yield to Ms. Bell.